Hi everyone, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm from Parkopedia and the title of my talk today is The Future of Parking is Automated. Why AVP is more realistic than robo-taxis. So I'm going to start just by saying a few words about Parkopedia. Uh, Parkopedia is the global leader in digital parking services. We were founded uh, a little over 12 years ago with the express aim of helping drivers to park. Uh, we now par power parking services, um, which consist of search uh, and of predictive availability and also transactions uh, all over the world in millions of connected cars, uh, also through our website online and our app. And we supply detailed parking venue information. Uh, some numbers, we operate uh, in more than 89 countries, 15,000 cities, and we have more than 70 million parking spaces on our database, um, with more than 650,000 locations with predictive availability and uh, nearly 200,000 with transaction capability. We mostly work. Well, we mostly work with the tiered suppliers, the automotive manufacturers, and we also work with mapping and navigation providers. So these are some of the customers that we have. So what do we do? Well, we provide the full suite of cloud parking services. And I like to think of this as being four different uh, products that we offer to the market. So starting from the, the left, static data. Static data is all about answering the question, where can I park? So it's metadata about car parks. Um, secondly, we offer dynamic data. Uh, that is all about predictive availability, and it helps to answer the question, when I get there in 10 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour, what is the probability that there will be at least one space for me? And then to make that more useful, we also offer transaction capability, so the ability to reserve uh, a space or to book or to pay you know, on-demand payments, uh, so that transaction capability. And then finally, our last product is indoor maps. Um, and here we're thinking about both uh, individuals who may want to drive their car through a car park um, and be able to navigate their way around the car park and also thinking about uh, automated valet parking, so vehicles actually parking themselves. So let's have a look uh, very briefly at the history of self-driving or automated driving. And the first thing to note really is that the idea is old. Um, it's been around at least since the 50s. So you can go look on YouTube and you'll find the GM Motorama exhibit of 1956. Uh, it's a fascinating video to watch, but you, you can see very clearly that the idea has been around for a long time. Uh, back then, they promised that it would be in production, available to the consumers, to, to the masses within 20 years. But it's taken a little bit longer than that. Then there was some pioneering work by Ernst Dickmans, uh, especially during the 80s and, and early 90s. Um, there is his Mercedes-Benz with vast amounts of computing power, at least back in the day. Now, you know, a lot of this computing power is found in, in our mobile phones. Um, that was followed by the Eureka, sorry, the Eureka Prometheus project, um, also uh, with involvement by Ernst Dickmans and the Technical University of Munich. Uh, and this was all about the, uh, you know, driving across the entire uh, European continent. Um, and I think, if I recall correctly, it was about 4,800 kilometers that were driven under uh, autonomous control with disengagements, I think, on average, roughly every 150 kilometers. So just think about this for a moment. You know, in the early 90s, uh, there was a program to drive fully autonomously across Europe, and they did so over hundreds and thousands of kilometers along the motorways um, with relatively few disengagements. So if that happened 30 years ago now, uh, why has it taken so long? for us to have autonomous driving you know, available to us uh, as the general public. 
So thinking a bit more about the history, uh, things really got, uh, got moving through the DARPA Grand Challenges of 2005, you know, 2006, 2007. There were a few different Grand Challenges, um, and that really I think, kick-started industry again uh, and, and motivated many of the companies that we see uh, participating right now, um, really motivated them to, to get involved. One of the companies that was involved <coughs> was, uh, was Google, and that was also through uh, Sebastian Thrun and the Stanford Robotics Lab. Um, and that eventually became the Google self-driving car project, which in turn became Waymo. Um, and so Waymo is uh, arguably the leader in terms of self-driving technology. I'm sure that many of you have heard the name or at least familiar with, with what they do. So that's a whirlwind tour of the history of self-driving. And so now, you know, uh, what's it, nearly 70 years after uh, GM's uh, autopilot um, that they started talking about back in 1956. Um, the question that many of you will rightly be asking is, where can I hail a robo-taxi? Uh, so they have been promised since at least 2008 and hyped as the next big thing, the revolution in mobility. But you should be thinking, and I certainly I'm thinking, where can I actually go and try out a robo-taxi? It sounds amazing. Where can I try it? So it turns out there are a few places that you can try it now. Uh, one is uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where Waymo has been doing a lot of testing. And so you can go there now. But, I mean, it's, it's only really a small geographic area and you actually have to be signed up to their Waymo One program and they're limiting uh, the amount of people that can join that. So the second place that you could go and get a ride in a robot taxi is downtown Las Vegas, where Aptiv um, and Lyft have been doing a trial. Uh, or you might want to try in Shanghai in China, where AutoX is taking paid customers. Um, or more generally, it's not quite a robo taxi, but um, you know, autonomous driving for the masses. Uh, Tesla is busy rolling out a beta program uh, for its full, full self-driving stack. So, you know, no presentation would be complete without mentioning them. So, I guess what you can see here is, you know, there's been a lot of hype over the past, you know, let's say 30 years, and self-driving. Uh, I think has not lived up to the expectations that the general public will have of self-driving. Um, you know, you try and answer the question, where can I hail a robo taxi right now? And the answer is in a very few places where it's limited. So getting back to the title of this talk, uh, why AVP is the future of, uh, of parking and why it's going to be uh, available sooner than robo taxis. Uh, let's consider this question now. Why will AVP succeed? Well, to answer that, we need to think about why autonomous driving is hard. And really, the main reason is the complexity of interactions. And so, uh, here's a quote from Sasha Arnoux, uh, who was at the time uh, one of the, the leaders, the directors of Waymo's program. Uh, and he said, that the first 90% of the technology took only 10% of the time. To finish the last 10%, however, is requiring 10 times the initial effort. So it really is just because of this massive complexity of interactions. But luckily, the car park is a controlled environment. We know exactly what it is, what it looks like, and um, we can map it out in detail beforehand, and we know what it's going to look like, and we can control the interactions. Secondly, parking is a pain point. So uh, parking is the, the part of the journey that most people like the least and presents a challenge for many people and it's a stressful experience. And so um, there is good consumer demand to reduce that, uh, that experience or that's the stress of that experience. Phrased differently, customers actually want the feature, right? So, you know, when asked, 
um, what would you most want a self-driving car to do for you? You know, many people want it to be able to just park uh, because that's the part of the journey that they don't want to do. And finally, the costs of a self-parking system are actually quite reasonable, especially com compared to uh, full autonomy. And so low speed within a car park means low risk, constrained environment means reduced complexity of the interactions, and the cost of the required sensor suite and the hardware platforms are lower. So the costs are reasonable. So uh, the argument why AVP is gonna be available before um, the general deployment of robo taxis is that the environment is more constrained um, people want the feature there's demand for it and the costs are reasonable and to finish i'd like to direct you to the avp project of which uh, parkopedia is a part uh, you can find out more at avp-project.uk and if you have any questions please feel free to get in touch with me uh, here are my details